Don't, don't worry, the cat will definitely... We'll start in a few seconds, guys. Facebook has been kind to us lately. Oh, me and my big mouth. About eight seconds. Good evening, it's seven o'clock, and this is the Tibet Center, Kunshap Tardu Ling, a Buddhist meditation study and meditation and study center. I'll get it right one year. Located in New York City in northern New Jersey, this is our twice weekly presentation of the Buddha Dharma, specifically Lam Lam Chenmo, Stages on the Path to Enlightenment, written by Jay Sankapa. Finished in 1402, but relevant today, of course. If there's any problem with the voice, my voice, sound, light, etc., let me know right away or text me or text Darren Smith. If there's anyone for whom you want us to pray for when we do the Sutra, the Recollection of the Noble Three Jewels, place their names in the chat or comment box, whatever you call it, uh, as soon as possible. Don't wait till the end because, first of all, I don't get all the names, and secondly, there's about a minute delay at the end. Um, all the prayers that we say are on the website. The, the thetibetcenter.org in the FAQ section, scroll down to prayers. So we'll have a mixture of Zen poetry tonight, a little quantum physics, and of course, the good old Lam Rim. We can't do any, that pays the rent, right? <laughs> At least it has for the last 600 years or 800, whatever. Who knows? So we'll start. Prayer for the spreading of the teachings throughout the length and breadth of the West, including Lavinia's house. By the force of the blessings of the non-fallacious three precious gems and of the truth of our pure selfless wishes, may the precious Buddhist teachings flourish and spread to the expanse of all areas throughout the length and breadth of the West. For all the people living there together with their near ones who have engaged in the teachings and have faith and respect for them, may all conditions adverse to their practice of the pure Dharma be dispelled and an excellent collection of favorable conditions increase like the waxing moon and especially for those who work on methods to accomplish the flourishing and spreading of the victorious one's teachings, which are the source of benefit and happiness, may they never be oppressed by masses of interference and adverse conditions, and may this spontaneously happen just as we have hoped and wished. The Heart Sutra. Thus have I heard once, the Blessed One was dwelling in the royal domain of the Vulture Peak Mountain, together with a big gathering of great monks and great bodhisattvas. At that time, the Blessed One entered the Samadhi, which examines the Dharma's called profound illumination. And at the same time, Noble Avalokiteshvara, the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, looking at the profound practice of transcendent knowledge, saw the five skandhas and their natural emptiness. Then, through the inspiration of the Buddha, Venerable Shariputra said to Avalokiteshvara, how should those noble ones learn who wish to follow the profound practice of transcendent knowledge? And Avalokiteshvara answered Venerable Shariputra, Whoever wishes to follow the profound practice of transcendent knowledge should look at it like this, seeing the five skandhas and their natural emptiness. Form is empty. Emptiness itself is form. Emptiness is not separate from form. Form is not separate from emptiness. In the same way, feeling, discriminating, awareness, compositional factors, and consciousness are empty. Thus, all the dharmas are empty and have no characteristics. They are unborn and unceasing. They are not impure or pure. They neither decrease nor increase. Therefore, since there is emptiness, there is no form, no feeling, no discriminating awareness, no compositional factors, no consciousness. No eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no appearance, no sound, no smell, no taste, no sensation, no objects of mind, no quality of sight, no quality of hearing, no quality of smelling, no quality of tasting, no quality of sensing, no quality of thought, no quality of mind, consciousness. There are no nidanas from ignorance to old age and death, nor they're wearing out. There is no suffering, no cause of suffering, no ending of suffering, and no path, no wisdom, no attainment, no non-attainment. Therefore, since there is no attainment, the bodhisattvas abide by means of transcendent knowledge. And since there is no obscurity of mind, they have no fear. They transcend falsity and pass beyond the bounds of sorrow. All the Buddhas who dwell in the past, present, and future by means of transcendent knowledge fully and clearly awaken to unsurpassed, true, complete enlightenment. Therefore, the mantra of transcendent knowledge, the mantra of deep insight, the unsurpassed mantra, the unequaled mantra, the mantra which calms all suffering, should be known as truth, for there is no deception. In transcendent knowledge, the mantra is proclaimed, 
Tayata Om Gate Gate Paragate Parasam Gate Bodhisoha. O Shariputra, this is how a Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, should learn profound transcendent knowledge. Then the Blessed One arose from that Samadhi and praised the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Avalokiteshvara, saying, Good, good, O son of noble family, profound transcendent knowledge should be practiced just as you have taught, and the Tathagatas will rejoice. When the Blessed One had said this, Shariputra and Avalokiteshvara, that whole gathering in the world with its gods, humans, Asuras, and Gandharvas, their hearts full of joy, praised the words of the Blessed One. Refuge and Bodhisattva vow, which of course we recite three times. With the wish to free all beings, I shall always go for refuge to the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha until I reach full enlightenment. Enthused by wisdom and compassion today in the Buddha's presence, I generate the mind for full awakening for the benefit of all sentient beings. As long as space remains, as long as sentient beings remain, until then may I too remain and dispel the miseries of the world. With the wish to free all beings, I shall always go for refuge to the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha until I reach full enlightenment. Enthused by wisdom and compassion today in the Buddha's presence, I generate the mind for full awakening for the benefit of all sentient beings. As long as space remains, as long as sentient beings remain, until then may I too remain and dispel the miseries of the world. With the wish to free all beings, I shall always go for refuge to the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha until I reach full enlightenment. Enthused by wisdom and compassion today in the Buddha's presence, I generate the mind for full awakening for the benefit of all sentient beings. As long as space remains, as long as sentient beings remain, until then may I too remain and dispel the miseries of the world. May all the pains of living creatures ripen solely upon myself and through the might of the Bodhisattva Sangha, may all beings experience happiness. May the teachings, which are the sole medicine for suffering and the origin of every joy, be materially supported and honored and abide for a very long time. I prostrate to Manjagosha, through whose kindness wholesome minds ensue, and I prostrate to my spiritual masters, through whose kindness I develop. I look this way because the book is there. <laughs> we have now also the prayer for the swift return of Ratha Chungla Rinpoche, written by His Holiness, as a cause for the swift return of His, uh, to our sphere of perception, you might say, to the human life. Exalted wisdom of all victors gathered in a drop, soul, refuge manifest in the form of the one wearing saffron robes, Guru Lozang Tubuang Dorje Chang. Please bear witness here today that our prayers may be fulfilled. We beseech the great torch of doctrine, accomplishing from long ago the vast waves of aspirational prayers, Lord of speech of the victor Lozang's teachings, spreading them to the ends of the earth by means of explanation and practice. Though holding the commitment, I will invite all beings to be my guests in unsurpassed great awakening, yet you have withdrawn the activities of the form body that serves the welfare of others. Is that worthy of the supreme among beings, the bodhisattvas? Though impossible for you till cyclic existences end to abandon your commitment to liberate all beings, we beseech the new son of Nirmanakaya to swiftly return from the realm of Dharmakaya, brought forth by Bodhicitta, drawn by seven steeds. Having reached the far limits of scholarship, religious life, and goodness, please come swiftly as an unrivaled supreme emanation, full holder of the sage's teachings and wish-fulfilling jewel, return as the glory of Lozang Ten Pei. Magnificent truth of the three precious jewels, Mahakala Karmayama and Sri Mata Devi, and the ocean of Dharma protectors, may you spontaneously fulfill our wish, the swift blossoming of the reincarnation's fresh moonlight face. So, it's winter time now February. So it's time to hear a little Zen poetry. This is a book called One Robe, One Bowl, the Zen poetry of, I pronounce it Ryokan. I've heard Japanese people call it Ryokan. It's the same word they use for these Japanese um, guest houses or hotels that are in the rural areas, etc. I think it take, they take their name from this. This dates of 17, uh, he died in 1831 at the age of 70, so we go back. Um, the Zen master, Soto Zen, the uh, quiet Zen. Uh, you can see some of the elements of what we're studying here. But uh, I made it so I don't have to thumb through the whole book. I made a little outline of the poems I think would be useful for us. So this one is called Buddha is in your mind. Really? Not online? No. In your mind. 
Buddha is your is your mind. Never mind in your mind. Buddha is your mind, and the way goes nowhere. Don't look for anything but this. If you point your cart north when you want to go south, how will you arrive? Not that enigmatic. Think about it. Um, Something he lived alone in this cold uh, hut. And he wasn't afraid to have a little sake once in a while. <laughs> At the end of his life, he had uh, he was with a female companion. Uh, but the monks in uh, Soto Zen are not celibate. You know, you can be so it's it's okay. Uh, this is a haiku or a waka. Sometimes there's a, two types. Some of these poems are called Chinese poems. I guess he wrote them. I don't know, maybe Chinese characters were the same characters. So, Anyway, here's it. Oh, that my priest's robes were wide enough to gather up all the suffering people in this floating world. There's a lot there. Obviously, the bodhisattva motiv motivation towards all. And the floating world gives you a hint of the non-inherent existence of the world. They use that term, floating world, sometimes soon. Priest Ryokan must fade like this morning's flowers, but his heart will remain behind. <laughs> Here's another one. This is very haiku. Cool. The thief left it behind, the moon at the window. Very enigmatic, you know? There's, there's nothing rhymes. What's the matter with these people? Are they? <laughs> Let's see. 76. Form, color, and design. Form, color, name, Design. This is close to home from what we're talking about. Form, color, name, design. Even these are things of this floating world and should be abandoned. We work with them, but we abandon them on a certain level. <laughs> okay. You had enough? No. All right. So you're going to get more of it. At night, this is a regular poem now. At night, deep in the mountains, I sit in Zazen. That's this meditation. The affairs of men never reach here. In the sil stillness, I sit on a cushion across from the empty window. The incense has been swallowed up by the endless night. My robe has become a garment of white dew. Unable to sleep, I walk into the garden. Suddenly, above the highest peak, the round moon appears. If we had a class, we could discuss this, you know, back and forth. But anyway, just maybe we'll in the future. <laughs> Let's see, page 34. Hurry up, go to page 34 before the train comes. For more than uh, written in my hermitage on a snowy evening, let's name it. Sometimes he has titles, sometimes not. This one he titled. If the title is there, he named it. It's not the editor or anybody else. He put the title down. They're, they're very true to his writing. Written in my hermitage on a snowy evening. For more than 70 years, I have been making myself dizzy observing men. Human, you know. I have abandoned trying to penetrate men's good and bad actions. Coming and going is a sign of weakness. Heavy snow in the dead of night. Under the weather-beaten window, one incense stick. So the, mon the particular and the universal blend in nicely. Sounds like an English class, so let me shut up. <laughs> Page 28. If there is beauty, there must be ugliness. If there is right, there must be wrong. Wisdom and ignorance are complementary. And delusion and enlightenment cannot be separated. This is an old truth. Don't think it was discovered recently. I want this. I want that. There's nothing but foolishness. I'll tell you a secret. All things are impermanent. Yeah, we heard that already. <laughs> so, uh, let's see. One more we'll do because it's getting late. always getting late. We never have enough time, but that's our life.
Even if a man lives a hundred years, or a woman, doesn't matter, his life is like a floating weed, drifting with the waves, east and west continually, no time for rest. Shakyamuni renounced nobility and devoted his life to preventing others from falling into ruin. On the earth eighty years, proclaiming the Dharma for fifty, bestowing the sutras as an eternal legacy, today, still a bridge to cross over to the other shore. And today, so we'll leave it at that, but this is a nice quick hit book you can have but or go online all the poems are online you don't have to buy the book uh, he wrote a lot and they collected a lot he was very very famous so there's all kinds of shrines to him in japan i don't know the right pronunciation i've, I've heard japanese say leo khan it's a big deal we know <laughs> anyway he was uh, well schooled a real buddhist so a little bit of quantum physics and who gets it right and who gets it wrong this is our friend Carlo Ravelli. The book is called Helgoland. And it's sort of a popularization of quantum physics for people who are dumb, dummies like me who can't get their act together. He gets some things wrong. He uses his language a little loosely, you know, things don't exist, he's saying. Cause, but this is his encounter with Nagarjuna. This starts on page 149 of this book, Helgoland. Carl Ravelli, by the way, is also all over the internet. Uh, a lot of dialogues. He's now closely, before he wrote this book, I don't think he wrote this book, and, uh, probably wrote it before he met Geshe Namdak. Geshe Namdak and he talked, and I think they're doing joint conferences soon. Wonderful man. He's a Sarah Geshe, originally from Holland. So he speaks with a New York accent, which I like. So... He picks, here's on page 149, Carlo Rovelli is talking about, uh, in my own attempts to make sense of quanta for myself, I have wandered among the texts of philosophers in search of a conceptual basis with which to understand the strange picture of the world provided by this incredible theory. In doing so, I have found many fine suggestions and acute criticisms, but nothing wholly convincing. Until one day I came across a work that left me amazed I will end this chapter, which does not have any, have any conclusions, with a light account of this encounter. I did not come across it by chance. When speaking about quanta and their relational matter, nature, rather, their relational nature, I had frequently met people who asked, have you read Nagarjuna? Well, he's hanging out in the right crowd, that's for sure. <laughs> have you read Nagarjuna? You read Nagarjuna? You have. Good for you. No. When I'd heard my upteenth, have you read Nagarjuna? I decided to go ahead and read it. It took him a while. Though not widely known in the West, the work in question is hardly an obscure or minor one. It is one of the most important texts of Buddhist philosophy, so it was only due to my personal ignorance of Asian thought, not so character uncharacteristic in the West, that I was unaware of it. It's titled one of those never-ending Sanskrit words, Mula Madhyamika Karika, Karika, translated in numerous ways, including the fundamental Fundamental Wisdom of the Middle Way. Well, we're familiar with it because it comes out of our ears constantly, but uh, he's new to it. But he's very frank. I like that. I read it in a translation with commentary by an American analytic philosopher, Jay Garfield, he's talking about. It has made a profound impression upon me. Nagarjuna lived in the century, second century common era. There have been countless commentaries on his text which have been overlaid with interpretations and exegesis. Those are interpretations of religious texts. Why don't they just say explanations? I don't know. The interest of such ancient texts lies partly in the stratification of readings that gives them to us enriched by levels of meaning. What really interests us about ancient texts is not what the author initially intended to say. It is how the work can speak to us now and what it can suggest today. Well, he's reading it from an outside of you. We're reading it because we know exactly what they had in mind. It's a manual for practice. He didn't get to that point yet. Give him credit, though. <laughs> the central thesis of Nagarjuna's book is simply that there is nothing that exists in itself independently from something else. He's got that right, right on the money. The resonance with quantum mechanics is immediate. Obviously, Nagarjuna knew nothing and could not have imagined anything about quantum. I don't know about that. He may have been a Buddha. <laughs> That's not the point. The point is that philosophers offer original ways of rethinking the world so we can employ them if they turn out to be useful. 
The perspective offered by Nagarjuna may perhaps make it a little easy to think about the quantum world. If nothing exists in itself, everything exists only through dependence on something else. He's right. In relation to something else, the technical term used by Nagarjuna to describe the absence of independent existence is emptiness, shunyata. Things are, quote, empty in the sense of having no autonomous existence. He's right on the money. They exist thanks to, as a function of, with respect to, in the perspective of something else. If I look at a cloudy sky to take a simplistic example, I can see a castle and a dragon. What, have he been, what has he been smoking? I don't know. He sees a castle and a dragon. Do a castle and a dragon really exist up there in the sky? Obviously not. Oh, yeah, I saw it too. Never mind. Obviously not. The dragon and the castle emerge from the encounter between the shape of the clouds and the sensations and thoughts in my head. In themselves, they are empty entities. They do not exist inherently. You should have added, all right, we're going we're gonna to mark them a little down for that. <laughs> so far, so easy. All right. But Nagarjuna also suggests that the clouds, the sky, sensations, thoughts, and my own head are equally things that arise from the encounter with other things. They are empty entities. Hmm. And myself, looking at a star, do I exist? He should think, do, yes, you do exist. Uh, don't get frightened. You do exist. No, not even I, who is, uh, is observing the sky. You don't exist autonomously, but that's okay. No one says... No one says Nagarjuna, to, uh, no one says Nagarjuna, but no one exists inherently. You should always put that in, but let it roll. To see a star is a, comp a component of that self of interactions that I conventionally call myself. What articulates language does not exist inherently. The circle of thoughts do not exist. He's got to be careful. This is where I mark him not so good. I know what he means because he got the other part right. He knows what it's, but he's just saying it in a shorthand way, which could lead people astray. Picky, picky. Yeah, I know. There's no ultimate or mysterious essence to understand. That is the true essence of our being. Quote, I is nothing other than the vast and interconnected set of phenomena that constitute it, each one dependent on something else. Right. Centuries of Western speculation on the subject and on the nature of consciousness vanish like morning mist. Like much of philosophy and much science, Nagarjuna distinguishes between two levels, conventional apparent reality with its illusory and perspectival aspects, it's a new word, perspectival aspects, and ultimate reality. But in this case, the distinction also, the distinction takes us in an unexpected direction. The ultimate reality, the essence, is absence, is vacuity. It also does not exist inherently. He just says it does not exist. I say, go ahead. Em the emptiness of emptiness. We've heard this 10,000 times as we're drifting off in class. But then, and if every metaphysic seeks a primary substance, an essence on which everything may depend, the point of departure from which everything, from which everything follows, the prime mover of Aristotle, that kind of stuff, Nagarjuna suggests that the ultimate substance, the point of the departure, isn't there, does not exist. You know, that he's got right, I think. This is just my opinion, never mind. You have yours. There are timid intuitions in a similar direction in Western philosophy. But Nagarjuna's perspective is radical. Conventional everyday existence is not negated. On the contrary, it is taken into account in all of its complexity with its levels and facets. It can be studied, explored, analyzed, reduced to more elementary terms, but there is no sense, Nagarjuna argues, in looking for an ultimate substratum. And a lot of the materialist philosophers, of, of, of physicists, that's what they're doing, the ultimate particle. They, hey, well, go ahead. You get grants, so you might as well do it. You know. The difference be from contemporary structural realism, for instance, seems clear. I can imagine Nagarjuna adding a short chapter to a contemporary edition of his book entitled, All Structures Are Empty. <laughs> They exist only when you are thinking about organizing something else. In his terms, they are neither precedent to objects nor not pre precedent to objects. They are neither precedent to objects nor not precedent to objects. Neither are they both things, but not ultimately neither one nor the other thing. 
he's talking uh, mula madyamaka style here, not this, not that, or this. So what? Everything drives us crazy. You have to do some thinking on these points. The illusoriness of the world is its samsara, is a general theme of Buddhism. To recognize this is to reach nirvana, liberation, and beatitude. For, for Nagarjuna, samsara and nirvana are the same thing, both empty of their own existence, non existent, non inherent existence, okay? They're both non inherently existent. So is emptiness the only reality? Is this, after all, the ultimate reality? No, writes Nagarjuna in a most vertiginous chapter of his book. It gives you vertigo to read it. Vertiginous, that's what the word, I had to look it up. <laughs> I didn't grow up in a group that used the word vertiginous. <laughs> Maybe you did, but I didn't. <laughs> Every perspective exists only in interdependence with something else. That's something we should digest now. Every perspective exist only in interdependence with something else. There is never an ultimate reality, and this is the case for his own perspective as well. Even emptiness is devoid of essence. It is conventional. No metaphysics survives. Emptiness is empty. Nice. He worked it in. Nagarjuna has, give, Nagarjuna has given us a formidable conceptual tool for thinking about the relationality of quanta. We can think of interdependence without autonomous essence entering the equation. In fact, interdependence, and this is the key argument made by Nagarjuna, requires us to forget about all autonomous essences. Forget all about autonomous essences. The long search for the, quote, ultimate substance in physics has passed through matter, molecules, atoms, fields, elementary particles, and has been shipwrecked in the relational complexity of quantum field theory and general relativity. It is possible that a philosopher from an ancient India can provide. Is it possible that a philosopher from an ancient India can provide us with a conceptual tool with which to extricate ourselves? And he leaves it at that. Let's find it. Tune in next week to see if the philosopher from ancient India can leave us a tool. Dr. Barry has a little bit of. This is Dr. Barry's book, Nagarjuna's Wisdom. Dr. Barry Curzon, great human being, wonderful guy, actually a medical doctor. Uh, and his little chap, this is a book called Nagarjuna's Wisdom, A Practitioner's Guide to the Middle Way. We've had this before in class. And this is from page 25. Emptiness does not mean nothingness. After we rise from the meditation on emptiness, this is an argument we had Saturday, something, Mark was, let me see if Mark's online tonight. Mark, are you alive there? No, well, Mark is in Chicago, so they don't have internet in Chicago. I don't know, maybe they do. After we rise from the meditation on emptiness, Dr. Barry says, intrinsic reality begins to fade. It takes on an illusory-like appearance. Remember, there's space-like emptiness. Then your mind is so affected by that direct, I'm talking about direct, not conceptual, direct view of emptiness. Then you come out of that equipoise, and the resultant reality that you're starting to comprehend is called dreamlike emptiness because it's not as solid as it was before and the more you have deeper emptiness experiences the less solid you know it's there you see appearances of inherent existence but you're not fooled anymore something like being in a movie someone said i don't know i don't have this experience but so that's what they're getting at here takes on an illusory like appearance previously we thought there was an i a body and the mind all of which convincingly appear to exist objectively from their own side. You lose that when the, the emptiness equipoise happens. They actually appeared as though they were over there or over here, as, we, if we, as if we could put, point the finger at them. However, after prolonged meditation, nothing appears to exist anymore in the mode that it did before. It doesn't look like it did before if you come out of this uh, meditative equipoise. No? The space-like equipoise. You go into the dream-like. They'll call it that. But is there still the feeling of a self after meditation? Some teachers say there will be the appearance of the body after meditation. Yet the body we previously believed to exist objectively no longer appears in the same way. We gain the conviction that the body is like an illusion. It is merely designated by our words and thoughts rather than existing intrinsically and objectively over there. No, it's over here. Anyway, 
Take, for example, a house. All right? Before we understand the emptiness of a house, we must acknowledge the reality of the perceived house. Everyone agrees there is a house. We can sleep in the house, we can eat in the house, and we can live in the house. Maybe there is a video of the house. I'm sure you're paying taxes, too. The house is real. There has to be a house for there to be an empty house. After we understand the emptiness of the house, what happens? The house itself does not disappear. The house remains, but our view of the house changes radically. Key point, our view of the house changes radically. Before understanding emptiness, we view the house as existing objectively from its own side. Due to the house existing objectively, it becomes an object of attachment or aversion. Yes, I've heard them screaming. <laughs> when we understand the idea of the intrinsically existent house is mistaken, that idea is mistaken, then we understand the house to be merely designated by our mind. Now, you just don't do this conceptually because we're reading it now. Oh, yeah, that's what's You have to have the experience of the emptiness of the house, and then it dawns on you it's merely designated. So then the root of the attachment and the aversion has been sort of weakened. Not totally gone until you have deeper and deeper realizations of emptiness, but you're on your way to getting out of this trap of samsara. The more convinced we are in a merely designated house, the more our attachment declines. Of course, there is a basis of designation for the house, the physical combination of some walls, a door, a roof, that forms the thing we call, quote, house, or any other thing for that matter. But even the, this basis of designation does not exist intrinsically. Even the base is empty. That, that's a big point. I'm checking the time. The house is mentally created due to our preconceived ideas of a house. It's hard to understand that. I, I mean, I'm working on it. It's difficult. The house is mentally created due to our preconceived idea of a, ideas of a house. Therefore, when we conclude the house is empty, this does not mean that there is no house at all. It means there is no house like the intrinsically existent house we perceived before. We used to perceive the house existing intrinsically, independent of a perceiving mind, the subtlest dependence, a perceiving mind. Even though such a house does not exist, still there does exist a house conventional. The existence of the conventionally existent house depends on the basis of designation, its name, and a mind that designates this name. When there, these three factors come together, then there is a conventionally existent house. Dependent origination means absence of independent existence. Dependent origination means absence of independent existence. And absence of independent existence is precisely emptiness. Thus, dependent origination and emptiness have the same meaning. That's Dr. Barry's brief, on-the-spot view of ever. Of, Thing, same thing that um, Carlo Ravelli did, but also adding a practitioner's point of view. He stays, he's the Dalai Lama's main Western physician. He's with him all the time. And during COVID, I heard that he was living in the compound the whole time. Very nice. Even our friend Stephen, the late Stephen, I hope he's in a high realm now, praised him. And Stephen was very light with his praise. <laughs> He said at one time in India, Barry's walking around, all the people he saw was sick. Can I help you? Giving them antibiotics. You know, you didn't have to make an appointment. He showed up there with the stuff. He didn't have to do that. Good for him. So, we left off in Lam Rim 3 on page 127. 127. And this is the chapter where Nagarjuna is brought in. Uh answering the, the realist, which they're calling, uh, they're calling realists. Let's see, well, here it is. One, one, that's 127. What are you doing? Now? 137. This is the, my old book with Rinpoche's notes, which I thought I'd share with you. So we left, uh, the, the quote that we left uh, was, we propound that dependent arising of things is called emptiness. That which arises dependently has no intrinsic nature. That's a quote from Nagarjuna. Nagarjuna's commentary on the refutation of objections, the Vigraha Vayavartini Riti says, failing to comprehend the emptiness of things, so, this is Sankaba using arguments against the realists, and he brings in Nagarjuna to testify. Uh, 
and Ricochet's note at the top of this little thing is the emptiness of things are not separate nature of things. The emptiness of things are not separate nature from the things. That's his little quote, comment. And he would always yell when somebody said empty, empty by nature. He would always say that. You have to think that's the way they are. You, me, we're empty by nature. Yeah, Nagarjuna starts, failing to comprehend the emptiness of things, you essentialists look for something to criticize and argue against the Madhyamaka saying, your words lack intrinsic nature and therefore cannot refute the intrinsic nature of things. Here in Madhyamaka, the dependent rising of things is emptiness. Why? Because they lack intrinsic nature. Those things that arise dependently are not associated with intrinsic nature because they lack intrinsic nature. Why? Because they rely on causes and conditions. If things had intrinsic nature, then they would exist even without causes and conditions. Since such is not the case, they lack intrinsic nature. Therefore, we speak of them as empty. What exists without causes, conditions, and the perceiving mind? Not, much, not anything, really. Think about it. Not just things, some things are not, you know, permanent things and not caused, but uh, a perceiving mind, a designating mind has to get on the action for it to arise. So that's it. Similarly, Managajuna goes on, and we're on page 137, Laman 3. My words also are dependent arisings and therefore are without intrinsic nature. Because they lack intrinsic nature, it is reasonable to say that they are empty. Because things such as pots and cloth are dependent arisings, they are empty of intrinsic nature. Yet, a pot can receive and hold honey, water, and soup. A cloth can protect one from the cold, wind, and sun. He's showing that there's functionality in physical things that are empty of intrinsic existence. And there's functionality in, in words that are empty of intrinsic existence. So, and this is Rinpoche's note on the side here, proof of functionality within emptiness. That's what this chapter is about. He would, he would sum up things sometimes, so I, because I had to repeat this. And so anyway, this is a proof of functionality within emptiness. And so it is with my with my words, because they are dependent arising. They lack intrinsic nature. Yet they are fully capable of establishing that things lack intrinsic existence, and they're fully capable of causing a lot of trouble if you say the wrong words to certain people. Think about it. Yeah, they do things, all right? They're without intrinsic nature. Yes, we can prove that, blah, blah. But say the wrong thing, drop the F-bomb at the wrong time, and you're in court. <laughs> so, therefore, Nagarjuna goes on, if I would just shut up and let him talk. Therefore, it isn't appropriate for you to give the argument, because your words lack intrinsic nature, it is not tenable that they refute intrin the intrinsic existence of things. Thus, Nagarjuna speaks very clearly. Nadula Mo Sankapa, and then we'll go right to the same section in Geshe Sopa's commentary, uh, his Lamrim commentary, because he translates it a little differently, and maybe the way he lays out the words is a little easier to understand, because he's more modern. So, Sankapa goes on, one th the last third of the page of 137. Thus, Nagarjuna speaks very clearly about the pervasion, they're using logical talk now, that whatever relies on causes and conditions lacks intrinsic nature. And the counter-pervasion, get used to these words, that whatever has intrinsic nature does not rely on causes and conditions. He very clearly says that words without intrinsic nature can carry out refutations and proof. proofs. It is, even, is it even necessary to point out that dependent arisings, the production and cessation of afflicted and pure phenomena in dependence on causes and conditions is located right together with the absence of intrinsic existence? Do we have to say that? Didn't you get it yet? Well, I didn't get it, so it's good that you said it. No, anyway. Dependent arising is the best reason to use in order to know the absence of intrinsic existence. You should be aware that only the Madhyamaka experts have this unique approach, unique on the line. So if you hold that dependent production and dependent cessation would have to be essentially existent, and you would have to be, for order for things to have cause and effect, they have to be intrinsically existent, right? Intrinsic causes cause intrinsic uh, effects. Really? They used the words, but didn't understand what they were really saying. Who's they? It's a false argument to get us used to it. I'm sure they didn't make these mistakes, but it's a, a foil setup. 
So if you hold that dependent production and dependent cessation would have to be essential existence and you use the arguments against intrinsic existence to refute the dependent rising of production and cessation, then those arguments, like a god transformed into a demon, will be a tremendous obstacle to finding an accurate understanding of Madhyamaka. You are blocking yourself because you're not thinking carefully. You're letting the meaning fly right through your mind. Yeah, this, this. you can't do that. Everyday life, we do it. <laughs> Here we're trying to get out of the jail of samsara. We have to be very careful. You know? And it doesn't cost anything to think carefully. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> never mind. <laughs> no joke there. In that case, when you develop a sense of certainty that phenomena lack even a particle of essential or intrinsic nature, you will then have no basis for developing certain knowledge of the relationship between cause and oh, let me read that again in that case when you develop a sense of certainty that phenomena lack even a particle of ascension or intrinsic essential or intrinsic nature you will then have no basis for developing certain knowledge of the relationship between cause and effect within your own system in other words once you realize our system you can't go around positing an intrinsic thing causes an intrinsic effect can't something's intrinsic sits there and that's it or inherent you could use that word or if you do develop a sense of certainty about cause and effect within your own system, then it will be impossible for your system to foster certain knowledge of the absence of intrinsic existence. You will have to find some other way to construe what the Buddha meant in speaking of the absence of intrinsic existence. If this is the case, then you must understand that you have not yet found the Madhyamaka view. Go back to the drawing board. And now Rinpoche put a little note here, precepts. So Sanka in this paragraph on 138, almost half the way down, what will help you find the right view? As a basis, you should be pure in upholding your ethical commitments. So now the whole being of you comes into effect to try and learn this, not just reading, reading. You have to live it. So, so what helps? You, be, you should be pure in upholding your ethical commitments. Then strive in many ways to accumulate the collections of merit and wisdom and clear away obstruct, obscurations confession, generosity, ethics, and so forth. All that thing come, all those things come into play. Method and wisdom are joined. Rely on the learned, making efforts to study and reflect upon their instructions. And here, Pache said, very important here, since certainty about appearances and certainty about emptiness almost never develop together, it is extremely difficult to find the Madhyamaka view. This is what Nagarjuna meant in the 24th chapter of the fundamental treatise, Mulamadhyamaka Karika. Therefore, knowing that, this is Nagarjuna's quote from that, knowing that those of limited intelligence would have difficulty understanding the depths of his teachings, the mind of the sage turned away from giving this teaching. When he realized it, he said, no way going to understand this. I'm heading to the woods. But then... He was roused out of that. I think Indra gave him a conch shell or something signifying you should blow the conch of the Dharma, sound of the Dharma. And he did. Precious gall in the same theme. When the impurity of this body, which is coarse, directly observable, and continuously appearing, does not stay with the mind. Our bodies are not pure. But we listen to, you know, Madison Avenue, or this, you'll feel fresh, you'll do this. You ain't. Try not washing for a few days. You, you don't smell so good. Oh, you did already? I see you. Don't come to class. No. <laughs> so, he said, if we don't see the gross impurity, the gross impurity of our body, which is really, if you took two seconds, yeah, we have to constantly clean and this and that, it, it deteriorates. We gloss right over that. How are we going to find emptiness? We're glossing over the whole of reality here. So let's see. So then how could the excellent teachings, which had the excellent teaching meaning, Chukla Rinpoche says, teaching on emptiness, it means, which has no basis. And what does no basis mean? Rinpoche's note says, no basis for afflictions. Is not immediately apparent and is most subtle and profound, easily come to mind. How could this? The excellent teachings, which get rid of the affliction, doesn't easily come to mind. Realizing that because of its profundity, this teaching is difficult to understand, the sage, when he became a Buddha, turned away from giving this teaching at first. So we switch you now to our sister station, Geshe Sopa. If we have time, color appeal. We got about six minutes. Geshe Sopa is going to go over the same material now. I'm not waiting to the end of the chapter. This way we can um, 
maybe you understand it better. So, if you're bored, try some Hagen Dazs. I don't know. Send out for pizza. Okay, this is Lamrim 5. Same quote from Nagarjuna's uh, Vigraha Viratani Viti. When fully understanding the meaning of the emptiness of things, this is Geshe Sopa's translation of Nagarjuna's text. Without fully understanding the meaning of the emptiness of things, you criticize me, saying, your words do not inherently exist and so cannot refute the inherent nature of things. There's that same argument again in different words. Now, whatever is the depending arising of things, that is emptiness. Why? Because it is the, it is the lack of inherent existence. Any things that dependently arise do not have inherent nature because they do not inherently exist. Why? Because they depend on causes and conditions. If things existed inherently, then they would exist even without causes and conditions. Since th that too is not the case, they do not have inherent nature. Thus, so as to explain, I say they are empty. Likewise, my words, de my words dependently arise because they do not inherently exist because they do not inherently exist, it is correct to say they are empty. For example, because pots, woolen shawls, and so on merely dependently arise, they are empty of inherent existence. Yet the former can hold and carry honey, water, and milk, and the latter can protect one from the cold wind and sun likewise. Because my words too dependently arise, they do not inherently exist, yet they have the ability to prove that things do not have inherent nature. Therefore, it is not correct to say to me, your words do not inherently exist and so cannot refute the inherent nature of things. So now this is the section on the pervasion, the counter-pervasion. It's good to get used to the way they talk because they use this logic and they use these logical terms. So we don't have to get to be great debaters or anything, but we at least understand them more fully so that we don't get lost when we read these texts. Sankapa comments, that this passage clearly states that if things depend on causes and conditions, this is Geshe Sopa's own words now, it follows that they are not inherently existent, and if things are inherently existent, it follows that they do not depend on causes and conditions. The first statement expresses a logical relation called the forward pervasion. pervasion. Forward pervasion. What's that? Kyab? Kung Kyab? The pervasion is Kyab? Something all pervading Kung Kyab? That's an odd title of the art. Uh, sent. You think we should? I should know it right now. <laughs> anyway, the forward perversion. In other words, whatever is dependent on causes and conditions is not inherently existent. The second statement expresses the counter perversion. Whatever is inherently existent is not dependent on causes and conditions. That's it. Simply forward counter. Moreover, sometimes they say reverse perversion. I don't know. Uh, moreover. This passage says that although words are not inherently existent, they are able to perform the functions of affirming and negating or proving and refuting. The lower tenet systems say that dependent arising and ceasing of afflicted and pure phenomena is contradictory to a lack of inherent existence. In the Madhyamaka system, these are shown to be harmonious. Not only does the acceptance of one enable the other to be accepted, but the existence of one also enables the other to exist. He's using technical terms now, get used to it. In short, the attributes empty of inherent existence and causally produced are united within a common locus. If two attributes have a common base of instantiation, then they are not contradictory. So, common locus, not contradictory. Um, the reverse is true of contradictory attributes. They cannot share a common base because if one exists within a certain lotus, then the contradictory attribute cannot exist there. Later in the text, we will encounter different types of contradictions, but this is the basic meaning of non-contradictory. Here, one thing can both dependently arise and be empty of inherent existence. In other words, causality and not existing by way of its own nature are not contradictory. Since these two are not contradictory, they can be instantiated within a common base. In the present context, the term common base is, is used in the most restrictive way. It indicates that two attributes have the same meaning in the technical sense of explaining the go, uh, above. So there is no occasion when something is one but not the other. Night or day, things like that. 
So one doesn't exclude the other, in other words. They are complementary to each other. In other words, they are coextensive, in other words, they like to use. You probably heard that in math, right? Coextensive? That term, no? I don't know anything about math. No, he's, he's off duty. He's tired. Some of the Buddhist logic terms. Yeah. Probably Western uses, uses them. They are coextensive. Whatever dependently arises is empty of inherent existence, and whatever is empty of inherent existence dependently arises. So that we can understand. When they give the example, it's very nice. We like that. Okay, we have just one paragraph more. Therefore, even though dependent arising, a conventional truth, is not itself emptiness and ultimate truth, and vice versa, dependent arising and emptiness should not be seen as contradictory. Each is an attribute of the other. Anything that dependently arises is empty, and anything that is empty dependently arises. We should understand that one acts as a reason for the other. Because this is dependent, it is empty. Because this is empty of inherent existence, it is dependent. In fact, dependent arising is the most effective reason for generating an understanding of the emptiness of inherent existence. Various logical reasons can be used to prove shunyata, such as the argument that none of the four alternatives of inherent causation is plausible, the argument that none of the four extremes of inherent existence and non-existence is plausible, and the argument that things are neither inherently one nor many. But, Madhyamaka's scholars say that dependent arising is the king of reasoning, establishing emptiness. So bear that in mind, cut to the chase, and use dependent arisings. Use it frequently in your home. Anyway, that's uh, page 100 of Geshe Sopas Lamrim 5. So that's all we have for tonight, to whom we will pray for. Let's see, I hope this isn't too boring. I'm sorry if it is, but it's in the books. We got we to gotta encounter it. Bula Bula Rana. Good morning. Alessandro Vene. Alessandro Alexander Vene, it's podcasted. You could wait till your neighbor's TV shuts down. <laughs> uh Tyre and Nicholas Nichols and family, yes, I think we had them before, but we'll do it again. Uh let's see. Anyone else? Okay, I don't have anything more. Uh, there are probably other names, but anyway. Uh we have to go. The Sutra of the Recollection of Noble Three Jewels on the website, of course. Thus the Buddha, Bhagavata, the Gata Arahat, Samyak, Sang Buddha, the learned and virtuous one, the Sagata, the knower of the world, the charioteer and tamer of beings, the unsurpassable one, the teacher of devas and humans, is the Buddha, Bhagavata. The Tathagata is in accord with all merit. He does not waste the roots of virtue. He is completely ornamented with all patience. He is the basis of the treasures of merit. He is adorned with the minor marks. He blossoms with the flowers of the major marks. His activity is timely and appropriate. Seeing him, he is without disharmony. He brings true joy to those along with faith. His knowledge cannot be overpowered. His strengths cannot be challenged. He is the teacher of all sentient beings. He is the father of bodhisattvas. He is the king of noble ones. He is the guide of those who journey to the city of Nirvana. He possesses immeasurable wisdom. He possesses inconceivable confidence. His speech is completely pure. His melody is pleasing. One never has enough of seeing him. His form is incomparable. He is not stained by the realm of desire. He is not stained by the realm of form. He is not affected by the formless realm. He is completely liberated from suffering. He is completely and utterly liberated from the skandhas. He is not possessed with dhatus. His ayatanas are controlled. He has completely cut the knots. He is completely liberated from extreme torment. He is liberated from craving. He is crossed over the river. He is perfected in all the wisdoms. He abides in the wisdom of the Buddha Bhagavats who arise in the past, present, and future. He does not abide in nirvana. He abides in the ultimate perfection. He dwells on the bhumi where he sees all sentient beings. All these are the perfect virtues of the greatness of the Buddha Bhagavat. The Holy Dharma is good at the beginning, good in the middle, and good at the end. Its meaning is excellent. Its words are excellent. It is uncorrupted. It is completely perfect and completely pure. It completely purifies. It purifies its functional. See? The Bhagavat teaches the Dharma well. It brings complete vision. It is free from sickness. It is always timely. It directs one further, seeing it fulfills one's purpose. It brings discriminating insight for the wise. The Dharma, which is taught by the Bhagavat, is revealed properly in the Vinaya. It is renunciation. It causes one to arrive at perfect enlightenment. It is without contradiction. It is pity. It is trustworthy and puts an end to the journey. As for the song of the great Yana, they enter completely, they enter insightfully, they enter straightforwardly, they enter harmoniously. 
They are worthy of veneration with joined palms. They are worthy of receiving prostration. They are a field of glorious merit. They are completely capable of receiving all gifts. They are an object of generosity. They are a great object of complete generosity. The protector who possesses great kindness, the omniscient teacher, the basis of oceans of merit and virtue, I prostrate to the Tathagata, pure the cause of freedom from passion, virtuous liberating from the lower realms. This alone is the supreme ultimate truth. I prostrate to the Dharma, which is peace. Having been liberated, they show the path of liberation. They are fully dedicated to the disciplines. They are a holy field of merit and possess virtue. I prostrate to the Sangha. I prostrate to the Buddha, the leader. I prostrate to the Dharma, the protector. I prostrate to the Sangha, the community. I prostrate respectfully and always to these three. The Buddha's virtues are inconceivable. The Dharma's virtues are inconceivable. The Sangha's virtues are inconceivable. Having faith in these inconceivables, therefore the fruitions are inconceivable. May they be born in a completely pure realm. And for the further cause for the quick return of Rato Chungla Rinpoche's Holiness Dalai Lama recommends that we say prayer for the flourishing Jay Sankapa's teachings. You'll find it on our website. Though he is the father, producer of all conquerors, as a conqueror's son, he produced the thought of upholding the conqueror's dharma in infinite worlds. Through this truth, may the conqueror Lozan's teachings flourish. When of you are in the presence of Buddha Indra Ketu, he made his vow, the conqueror and his offspring praised his powerful courage. Through this truth, may the conqueror Losang's teachings flourish. That the lineage of pure view and conduct might spread, he offered a white crystal rosary to the sage who gave him a conch and prophesied. Through this truth, may the conqueror Losang's teachings flourish. His pure view, free of eternity or destruction, his pure meditation cleansed of dark fading and fog, his pure conduct practiced according to the conqueror's orders, May the Kankor Lozang's teachings flourish. Learn, since he extensively sought out learning, reverent, rightly applying it to himself, good, dedicating all for beings in the doctrine, may the Kankor Lozang's teachings flourish. Through being sure that all scriptures definitive and interpretive were without contradiction, advice for one person's practice, he stopped all misconduct. May the Kankor Lozang's teachings flourish. Listening to explanations of the three Pitakas, realized teachings, practice of the three trainings, his skilled and accomplished life story is amazing. May the Conqueror Losang's teachings flourish. Outwardly calmed and subdued by the hearer's conduct, inwardly trusting in the two stages practice, he allied without clash the good paths of Sutra and Tantra. May the Conqueror Losang's teachings flourish. Combining voidness explained as the causal vehicle with great bliss achieved by method, the effect vehicle, Heart essence of 80,000 Dharma bundles, may the conqueror Losang's teachings flourish. By the power of the ocean of oath-bound doctrine protectors, like the main guardians of the three beings' paths, the quick-acting Lord, Vaishravana, Karma Yama, uh, may the conqueror Losang's teachings flourish. In short, by the lasting of glorious Guru's life, by the earth being full of good, learned, reverend holders of the teaching, and by the increase of power of its patrons, may the conqueror Losang's teachings flourish. And we're its patrons, so we should have more power. <laughs> Eight verses on training the mind. Right, Jackie? I see. Very good. As soon as I find it. Can you recite it by heart? I'm sure you can. <laughs> by Langtri Tanka, Tanka, great Bodhisattva. With the determination to accomplish the highest welfare of all sentient beings who surpass even a wish-granting jewel, I will learn to hold them supremely dear. Whenever I associate with others, I will learn to think of myself as the lowest amongst all and respectfully hold others to be supreme from the very depths of my heart. In all actions, I will learn to search into my mind, and as soon as a disturbing emotion arises endangering myself and others, I will firmly face and avert it. I will learn to cherish ill-natured beings and those oppressed by strong misdeeds and sufferings as if I had found the precious treasure difficult to find. When others out of jealousy treat me badly with abuse, slander, and so on, I will learn to take all loss and offer the victory to them. When the one whom I had benefited with great hope unreasonably hurts me very badly, I will learn to view that person as an excellent spiritual guide. In short, I will learn to offer to everyone without exception all help and happiness directly and indirectly, and respectfully take upon myself all harm and suffering of my mother's. I will learn to keep all these practices undefiled by the stains of the eight worldly concerns, and by understanding all phenomena as like illusions, be released from the bondage of attachment. 
So our next class will be, let's see, the 6th, February 6th, Monday night at 7 o'clock. There is no tire practice this week. It's going to be frosty, frosty cold here Friday and Saturday, so be aware. But the rest of you live everywhere else. It's probably nice and warm or whatever. And I'm sure the weather in Tushita heaven is always perfect. But <laughs> how do we get there? <laughs> we don't know. Anyway, thank you very much. It's a very thick topic. I know it's, we're in the weeds now, but it's authentic texts, root texts. So uh, we need to hear these things. Thanks for your patient listening. Big love to all of you. Take care, guys.